Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Anderson, and I direct the Global Economy Project here at the Institute for Policy Studies. And it's really my pleasure today to be talking with Saul Landau about the whole history of the Institute for Policy Studies related to the assassinations of IPS colleagues Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Carpin Moffat. For people who don't know, Orlando Letelier was a former Chilean ambassador and a very high profile critic of the dictatorship in Chile at the time. Ronnie Moffat was a young 25 year old American, and they were killed by a car bomb on September 21st, 1976, right here in Washington, D.C., by agents of the Chilean Pinochet dictatorship. Today, Saul is going to talk about the whole history of how IPS first got involved with the Chilean human rights struggle, and all the work that was done to pursue justice for his colleagues, Orlando and Ronnie. There are many stories uh, and many lessons that come out of this history, but for me, one of the most powerful ones is the story that persistence pays off. And I think there is no one who has been more persistent in this than Saul Landau. He's a, a model of the power of persistence. Um, in the aftermath of the attacks, he launched an independent investigation that turned into a book called Assassination on Embassy Row with John Dingus. He has helped support the Letelier Moffat Awards, which we've hosted here at IPS for 36 years that recognize uh, Orlando and Ronnie, but also lift up new heroes of the human rights movement. And through his teaching, and his films and his writings. He's gone out after dictators around the world and helped teach new generations about the importance of human, international human rights. So we're going to be hearing a lot more details about this from Saul in a minute. But first, we wanted to start off with a special letter that Representative George Miller has sent for us to share with you today. And that's going to be read by our director here at IPS, John Cavana. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> and thanks to all of you for coming. I see some. Uh, veterans of this uh, struggle for justice in Chile, uh, the struggle for justice in the cases of, of Orlando and Ronnie. Uh, and it's just wonderful to see you all here and wonderful to, to, to be here with Saul. I can't think of, of a better colleague over uh, the past 30 years at IPS than Saul in terms of someone who um, is there for you, both in terms of criticizing the work you do and in terms of being for you, uh, there for you when you need him. I'm going to just read this letter from Congressman George Miller. Um, we're joined also by his chief of staff, Danny Weiss, who many of you know, who has been uh, also a, a presence at the award ceremony. George Miller, with Saul, and I suspect Saul will get into this, was one of the Congress people who went to Chile after the coup and helped um, look for the disappeared there. He's been a key person in this case. So this is from Congressman George Miller of California. It was my hope to be here this afternoon to hear your talk on the Letelier Moffat investigation. Unfortunately, the House is voting this afternoon at the same time, so please accept this note as a poor substitute for my expression of thanks for everything you have done when it comes to human rights in Chile. Saul, you never gave up looking for the answers to who was responsible for the murder of Ronnie and Orlando, and you never gave up bringing them to justice, and I am personally grateful to you for that. You didn't stop with that horrible tragedy as you helped to pursue Pinochet all the way to the bench before a Spanish judge. You were the first person to recommend that my colleagues and I look into human rights in Chile in 1976, and you helped pave the way for an important and fascinating trip for us. I'm glad you are retelling the story of this case again today. As a historian and journalist, you know better than most the importance of retelling and relearning events of the past as you have consistently fought to brighten the future for all of us. See you soon, amigo. Sincerely, George Miller, Member of Congress. Thank you, John. And now I'd like to welcome Saul Landau. I thought I'd start by asking uh, Saul to reel back in his mind and really start at the beginning and tell us how he first uh, got to know Orlando Letelier and how he first came to IPS. In uh, 1970, I made a feature film in Chile called Que Hacer, What is to be Done. At the same time, uh, a little bit later in 1971, I had an interview with President Salvador Allende, which uh, I did with my film companion Haskell Wexler. And we filmed also simultaneously a film called Brazil Report on Torture, because Allende had invited a whole bunch of 
political prisoners from Brazil who had just been released in exchange for the Swiss ambassador. And so they all came to Chile and they told their stories of how they'd been brutally tortured. This film was put on Brazilian television last year. The protagonist of the film, a woman named Maria Auxiliadora, turned out she was the best friend of Dilma Rousseff, who had also been arrested and tortured during this period. So my adventure in Chile really began with the making of the feature film, which then we uh, presented in Washington, D.C., at what was known in those days as the Circle Theater on 21st in Pennsylvania. And uh, members of the Chilean embassy staff were also sent by the ambassador, Orlando Letelier, to see the film and comment on it. And then Orlando invited me to lunch at the Chilean embassy, and that's how I met him. I, I listened to six blistering critiques of the film <laughs> from the six of the minister counselors, each one representing a different political tendency, and thought that the film was not in favor of their tendency. And then Letelier spoke and said, I thought it was a terrific film. Uh, <laughs> so from then on, I, <laughs> I was engaged with him. I mean, my feeling was that we had done a spy story musical in Chile <laughs> with Country Joe McDonald, if anybody remembers Country Joe and the Fish. So th that was the film. Anyway, uh, in, I was at IPS when the horrible news of the coup in Chile came in uh, September of 1973. And we quickly learned that one of those who had been arrested on the day of the coup was Orlando, who was at that time serving as the Minister of Defense. And indeed, it was Orlando's own bodyguard who arrested him. Um, he was then sent to a concentration camp in Dawson Island, as close as you can get, probably, and keep living to the South Pole. Um, a year later, thanks to lots and lots of pressure, especially from the Venezuelan oil minister, to whom Chile was indebted, uh, Orlando was released. They never brought any charges against him because he hadn't done anything. There was no case to be made against him or any of the other people that they arrested. One of the former ministers, Jose Toa, was found hanged in his hospital cell. Um, the doctors had declared that he didn't even have strength enough to get out of bed, but somehow he supposedly tied a rope to the ceiling and hanged himself. Anyway, we all doubt, doubted that at the time and continued to doubt it. He was murdered. Anyway, Orlando was released in late 1974, and he went to Caracas uh, to join his family there, his wife, Isabel, and his four boys. And uh, I had suggested to Mark Raskin and Dick Barnett, who are co-directors of the Institute for Policy Studies, that we bring him to Washington and hire him to work with us on international human rights. They agreed. I called Orlando, long distance in Caracas. He came to Washington. He looked the joint over, and I guess he liked it well enough and said, yeah, he'd love to do it. And, and to belong also to what at that point was an IPS sister institute called the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. And very quickly, Orlando rose from being just a, a staff person at IPS to direct the Transnational Institute, the position that he held at the time he was murdered. Well, we worked closely together during the time he was here because much of his work was aimed at undermining the Pinochet dictatorship. Pinochet was the general who led the coup that dislodged the elected government of Salvador Allende. The United States government, which of course proclaimed its adherence to freedom and democracy, immediately backed the coup and the, the cabal of generals and admirals that took over Chile in the name of anti-communism, of course, which was total nonsense. It was a coup that was plotted by the military and backed by the United States. U.S. Navy, coincidentally, in quotes, had maneuvers off the coast of Chile at that time. And the job of the Navy really was to monitor the communications from the various Chilean military bases so as to report to the coup makers if the 
might be any resistance forming at any one of the bases. In other words, to avoid civil war. So that was the US government's role in the coup, still to be really uh, unraveled by documents. We still haven't seen the documents on this, but we've talked to enough people in national security circles to be certain that this is true. Well, uh, when Orlando came here, he also took on two staff members, one of whom was Juan Gabriel Valdez, who later became Chile's foreign minister. And the other one was Waldo Fortin. And they essentially uh, briefed congressional delegations going down or any other groups going down, as well as you know putting out material uh, to show what the Chilean dictatorship was really like. I mean, Salvador Allende was the first really elected socialist in the modern period to take over as head of state. And he was dis deposed by a gang of criminal military officers. I don't know any other way to put it. Because there was no question about the freedom and fairness of the election that Allende won in September of 1970. That was undisputed. Anyway, um, Pinochet did not like to have enemies who knew about his past. And he began systematically, really, to eliminate them. Uh, the first attempt was made against General Carlos Prats, who had exiled himself in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. Prats, one day in 1974, I think it was in early October, was literally blown nine stories high by a bomb that was placed in his car. Mrs. Prats, unfortunately, was sitting next to him in the car. And she was equally destroyed. Uh, we found out very later that the author of this attempt was an American citizen named Michael Townley, who had become an official in DINA, which was the Chilean secret police intelligence. That he had been ordered to, to kill Prats and had done so with the aid of his Argentine conspirators who were also linked to government security agency in Argentina. Then there was an attempt in 1975 against a leading Christian democratic legislator who had exiled himself in Italy. Uh, Bernardo Leighton and his wife were taking a stroll on a Rome street one night when a, an assassin came up behind them and shot them both in the back of the head. Again, this turned out to be a, a deal which Michael Townley had coordinated at the orders of the Chilean secret police. So it was not as if we had no feelings or suspicions that Letelier might be a target. But in Washington, D.C., that would be absurd. How could anybody be stupid enough to, to carry out a political assassination in the heart of the empire? It didn't make any sense. Anyway, we were nevertheless always a little bit nervous and watchful. My wife and I went to dinner at Letelier's house on September 19th. And this was just days after Pinochet had stripped him of his Chilean citizenship because he had been critical. As the letter from George Miller indicates, we had helped stimulate a fact-finding trip by members of Congress. Along with George Miller was Toby Moffat, who at the time was a congressman from Connecticut, and Congressman Tom Harkin, today a senator from Iowa. Harkin stumbled into what was a leading secret police intelligence operation where they were holding and torturing prisoners, and uh, knocked on the door, and somebody said, who's there? And he says, this is Congressman Tom Harkin from the United States House of Representatives. And there was much confusion in, inside the house. But finally, they let him in. And Harkin was able to hear the screams of some of the prisoners. He came back. And with the help of George Miller and Toby Moffat and other liberal members of the house, they passed the Harkin Amendment, which cut off Chile from everything but humanitarian aid. Needless to say, in Pinochet's tiny mind, there was only one person who could have engineered this horrible coup, and that was Orlando Letelier who had also traveled to Europe, where he was encouraging European governments to cut off all aid to Chile and cut off relations with that country because of its illegal government. Well, shortly after Letelier had returned from a trip to Europe, um, Pinochet stripped him of his citizenship. Letelier's resp angry response at a 
rally in Madison Square Garden in New York was, I, am a Chil I was born a Chilean, I am a Chilean, I will always be a Chilean, and he accused Pinochet of being a traitor, which of course he was. He said, I will die a I will, Chilean. I will die a Chilean, and Pinochet is a traitor. Well, he returned to Washington. This was September 19th. We had a long dinner at Letelier's house, and after the dinner, we walked out, and conversation continuing, and I put my elbows on the hood of the car, not, of course, realizing that there was a bomb under it. I didn't realize that until two days later. Anyway, that was a Sunday night. Nothing happened on Monday. On Tuesday morning, I got a call from my wife, who at that time worked in the House of Representatives, and she said, I've just seen the most horrible auto accident I have ever seen in my life. There were pieces of a body and blood out on Sheridan Circle, and the car is still was steaming and fire was coming out of it, and people were screaming. I said, oh gosh, I'm really sorry you had to witness such a terrible thing. Maybe 10 minutes later, the receptionist from IPS called me up, and, and in between hysterical outbursts and sobbing, crying, and shrieking, she managed to convey the fact that Mark Raskin and Dick Barnett had gone to the hospital along with Orlando, who was dead, and Ronnie, who was either dead or dying, and would I come to IPS and just sort of take charge? So I took a cab to IPS. Uh, the cab was not allowed to enter Sheridan Circle. It had been blocked off. I quickly took a look around and saw what turned out to be the world's largest vacuum cleaner. The FBI had ordered in a vacuum cleaner to literally suck up all the evidence from Sheridan Circle. Anyway, I got to IPS and just didn't know what to do. What does one do? So I said, well, lock the door. Don't let anybody in. That seemed to be safe. Uh, but within minutes, Washington, D.C. police were banging on the door with dogs, saying, uh, let us in. We got to inspect the building in case there's a bomb in it. And I said, where's your warrant? And uh, the cops said, warrant, you dumb, and I won't say the word. <laughs> um, he says, you know, your, your colleagues just got bombed. We want to make sure there's none in the building. And I'm thinking to myself, remember, we're in the mid-70s here. How much of the staff's got grass hidden in the office or stale <laughs> acid or whatever, right? <laughs> and these damn dogs are going to sniff it. <laughs> anyway, the cops prevailed. And in they went. And uh, luckily, they didn't find any grass or bombs. And as they exited the building, the dogs went crazy in front of a car that was parked directly in front of IPS. Everybody was evacuated from our building, from the building across the street. The restaurant was shut down, and the street was blocked off as the Washington, D.C. bomb squad came in to inspect the car. And of course, what did they find but some stems and seeds in the back? <laughs> so there it was. <coughs> In the meantime, Mark and Dick returned from the hospital, <clears throat> and I had taken the opportunity to call a press conference and told them about it. And they say, that's wonderful, but like, what are we going to say? I said, you're going to say that our response to Pinochet's murder is we're hiring Orlando Latelier's widow, Isabel Morel Latelier. This is the answer to Pinochet. We're not going to let up for one minute. And they said, that sounds like a good idea. Later on, they said, what the hell did we do? <laughs> but anyway, so that's what they said at the press conference. They named Pinochet as the assassin and Chilean secret police as the agency that dealt with the assassination. And, you know, all the networks were covering it. This was the act of foreign terrorism on U.S. soil. Remember, this is September 21st, 1976. The staff and fellows of the Institute are shocked. Some are crying. Some are, you know, sort of shocked numb and couldn't even talk. Um, who, who in Washington, D.C. would expect a car bombing on Sheridan Circle? Anyway, that's how it all began. And then there was a big debate inside of IPS. And I insisted, along with my colleague Ralph Stevens, that we can't let this go and we can't tr just trust it to the FBI to solve the case, that we had to conduct our own investigation and get to the bottom of this. 
and we began an investigation. There was real opposition to doing this. <clears throat> Some people said, look, why don't you just blame it on the CIA and let it go, just move on? Or it's too dangerous. Why do you want to do this? I mean, we've already lost two people. You want to lose more? I said, come on, you can't let anybody get away with this stuff. You can't let your colleagues just get whacked like this and not do anything. You've got to do something. And Mark and Dick backed me all the way. And with Ralph, we set out to do our own investigation. We started interviewing people and going through documents and so on. And very quickly, we identified uh, a very tight link between the Chilean government and an extreme right wing of Cuban exiles that were based in northern New Jersey called the Cuban Nationalist Movement. At the time, the leader up in northern New Jersey was one Guillermo Novo Sampol. Uh, so we focused attention on this group. And we found out also very quickly, because the FBI was immediately in doing interviews, although, I mean, the early interviews did not give us a lot of confidence, because one of them had asked uh, Michael Moffat, had said, this is Dina, Dina did this, the name of the Chilean intelligence agency. And one FBI said, agent said to him, well, what's her last name? <laughs> Anyway, uh, we met the lead investigator, FBI investigator, Carter Cornick, and he seemed to me sincere. And I said, you know, when he said, we've got to interview Isabel now, I said, well, we're going to have people sitting in with you. He said, what? What are you, crazy? He said, this is a murder investigation. I said, a murder investigation? The FBI sent 70-odd you know, informants into IPS over the late 1960s and early 1970s. We have no reason to trust you whatsoever. And Cornick looked me straight in the face and said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm a criminal investigator. My job is to find out who did this and bring him to justice. And I was convinced. I mean, he was obviously honest and, and didn't know anything about what had happened. But the FBI investigators were less than, how should I say, illuminating in their interrogations. They really didn't know much. And so we began to pursue and share information with them. What we got, they, we gave them about the Cuban exiles and their links to the Chilean government. Um, and this s mostly cooperation and sometimes antagonism continued throughout the investigation. At some points, they said, you know, you guys are going too far. You're going to get yourselves hurt. Um, and we probably did some pretty stupid things when I look back on it. I mean, going into interview some of the right-wing Cuban exiles who could easily have shot us dead. Luckily, they didn't. Anyway, um, in, I guess it was 79, 79, the U.S. government announced that it was going to indict on the case. And we went to see the assistant U.S. attorney, and I swiped a copy of the indictment off of his desk when he went to his filing cabinet for something. Um, anyway, uh, Isabel and I went to a big meeting of the Chilean Unidad Popular, that is, uh, the Allende government in exile in Spain. And I presented the case that the U.S. government was going to indict high-ranking members of the Chilean secret police, including the director and the number two guy, as well as a whole bunch of Cuban Americans. And everybody walked out of the room as if, you know, somebody had told a really distasteful joke or, you know, passed gas at the microphone or something. They just left the room. And they showed absolutely no interest in cooperating and told me I was a naive idiot. How could I ever believe such absolute rubbish? Well, shortly afterwards, the indictment became public. And uh, heading the indictment was Manuel Contreras, who was the head of the Chilean DINA, the secret police, and the number two guy as well along with Michael Townley, the American, and his partner, Armando Fernando Fernandez Larios, another member of the Chilean Armed Forces. And then a list of five right-wing Cuban exiles who belong to that New Jersey group. Guillermo Novo and his little brother, Igna Ignacio Novo Sampol, Alvin Ross, uh, Jose Dionisio Suarez, and Virgilio Paz. Those were the five who were indicted. The FBI arrested three of them. Two of them fled. And the first trial was held in Washington, D.C. 
with an all-black working-class jury. And the jury came in with a verdict of guilty on every charge led by conspiracy to commit assassination. And Guillermo Novo and Alvin Ross received life sentences. Ignacio Novo received, I think, 15 years for aiding and abetting. So that was the first trial. And uh, we were, well, we got a measure, a small measure of justice. And I remember the, the then director of IPS, Bob Borisaj, made t-shirts which said DFWTI, don't fuck with the institute. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody wore those for a few days, and you know we felt pretty good. <laughs> At the same time, Michael Tiger and Sam Buffone, two lawyers in Washington, filed a civil suit uh, against the defendants for damages and wrongful death, and against the Chilean government. That suit later paid off. Both uh, the Letelier and Moffat families received rather substantial sums of money as a result of the civil suit. Uh, none of the individual hit guys was ever touched by it. Uh, the lawyers just couldn't get at their dough. Anyway, the first, the first trial was, of course, uh, succeeded by an appeal by the lawyers for the three Cubans who were convicted. And they were all paid, by the way, by the Chilean government. Uh, two Jewish lawyers from northern New Jersey took the case. And on the second, in the second case, they had learned from all the mistakes they made in the first case. First mistake was the Cubans had dressed in, they, they looked like pimps when they came into the courtroom with duck's ass haircuts. You know, I mean, they just looked like hoodlums strutting into the courtroom. And I think the jury sort of took one look at them and said, these guys shouldn't be out on the street. <laughs> in the second case, they came in in banker suits with very clean cut haircuts. And the entire defense case rested on the interrogation of Michael Townley, who indeed was a very sinister character. I mean, Townley, this American who was a real loser, that is, he, he never got anywhere. He was uh, a, a dabbler in electronics and stuff like that, but he never really made any money. His father was the head of Ford Motors in Chile and friends with high U.S. embassy officials, including CIA officials. Anyway, Townley, after the coup, or before the coup, had joined a group called Patria y Libertad, Fatherland and Freedom, and was indicted for the murder of a watchman in some plant that they were sabotaging. This was before the election of Allende. So he had a criminal indictment on him. Anyway, uh, he hung out with all of these right-wing oafs. And uh, after the Pinochet coup, he was hired to work for the Chilean intelligence secret police as an interrogator and general hitman because among his dabbling in this electronic stuff, of course, he learned how to make bombs and detonators and fancy rigs to detonate bombs. So Townley became an important operator inside the Chilean secret police. Anyway, the FBI finally figured out who he was because the original plot to kill Letelier uh, involved Townley and Fernandez Larios, the two DINA agents, going to Paraguay to get passport, Paraguayan passports on which they were going to travel to Washington. Allegedly, they were going to visit General Vernon Walters, who was deputy director of the CIA at the time. The ambassador who told the consul general in, in Asuncion, Paraguay, to give them the visas was paying back a favor to the Paraguayan government, who had a appealed to the U.S. Embassy to give them the visas. The Consul General, who was a pretty you know, stiff-backed civil servant, said, I can't issue these visas without a written order. So the ambassador, who has the same name I do, Landau, authorized in writing the issuance of the visas 
to Townley and Fernandez Larios, both of them traveling under false names. But he, he then also wrote to Kissinger, his boss, and to the director of the CIA, George Bush, uh, saying he had issued these visas but felt a little bit funny about it. And is it true that these people did have a meeting with General Walters? He didn't get any reply from either CIA or state. And he got really nervous. And he sent another order saying, uh, withdraw the request for visas. But by this time, Townley and Fernandez Ladio said this whole thing has been sort of dragging a little too far, and they aborted the mission. And then they refocused it. They sent two other DINA officers using the same false names to Washington on a vacation trip. Uh, and they both had very high profiles when they got to Washington. They, they went out looking for hookers and went, on, and went to all the well-known clubs and so on. Diversion. Fernandez Larios then came to Washington, D.C. with his alleged honeymoon bride, who was also a woman working for the Chilean intelligence agency. She was a hooker that had been recruited by Dina. Anyway, they registered in the hotel, what was it the Was Hotel Washington on, is it 14th Street? 15th? No. 15th Street, on 15th Street. Uh, and in, in this period, uh, Fernandez Larios used his alleged honeymoon to scout Letelier's house and his route to work. He met Michael Townley traveling under the name of Kenneth Enyard at the, air, at the JFK airport and, and gave Townley all of the information needed to locate Letelier and follow him to work. Townley then went to uh, northern New Jersey, to Weehawken, New Jersey, where these right-wing Cuban exiles hung out. And in a series of meetings, he contracted with them to do the bombing with him. They would supply the material and some of the personnel, and uh, Pinochet would take care of them. That was essentially the deal. They were trying to recruit Pinochet in their in their lifelong war against Fidel Castro, allegedly. Anyway, the FBI had an informant inside the group. But unfortunately, the informant didn't tell until after the assassination. Anyway, so Townley drives down to Washington with Virgil or Virgilio Paz and Jose Dionisio Suarez. They check into a cheap motel on New York Avenue. <coughs> And then they go shopping for the missing parts that they needed to make up the rest of the bomb, which they got at Sears Roebuck. Uh, Townley makes the bomb, showing the Cubans how to do it, and rigs a remote-controlled detonator to the bomb in a cake pan. Uh, early, on Saturday night, or early Sunday morning, that would be the 18th, 19th of September, Townley crawls under Letelier's car in his driveway in uh, Bethesda and tapes the bomb to the I-beam of the car. That was the car I put my elbow on that night, that Sunday night. Anyway, Townley then leaves town because his orders are not to be in the locale when the bomb goes off. So Dionisio Suarez and Virgilio Paz are left there to do the job. Apparently, they missed Letelier on Monday morning when he drove to work, but they pick him up on Tuesday morning. And unfortunately, Ronnie Moffat and Michael Moffat are in the car with him because their car had broken down and they lived nearby in Bethesda. So Orlando was giving them a ride to work. And they preceded them. Let me explain that Ronnie and Michael were married. And yes. He lived, he worked here too. Yes, both Ronnie and Michael worked at IPS. Ronnie was Mark Raskin's assistant for about a year and then went into the development office. And Michael was working on international economics with Orlando. In fact, they had co-authored an article. Anyway, we had all gone to their wedding in May earlier that year. And I remember the canopy Oh, in an absolutely startlingly gorgeous um, late May day, all of a sudden, from nowhere, a violent wind came and blew the canopy off uh, the covering 
off where the bride and groom were going to get married. And everybody saw this as some kind of an omen. We didn't know what, but there it went. It was Dick, Mark, and I were all at the wedding. Anyway, that had preceded it. And, th and this was a very loving couple. I mean, they were sort of made for each other. Uh, everybody adored Ronnie. I mean, I used to go sit with her on the park bench in the hot days uh, of the summer of 1976. We'd share a joint, you know, <laughs> sitting next to the cops who were there. <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, she was a spectacularly wonderful young woman uh, who had not liked teaching and uh, found IPS as a real haven for her political beliefs and her activism. And she met Michael at IPS and their romance developed into marriage. And they happened to be in the car. Dionisio and Suarez picked them up and went ahead of them into Sheridan Circle. And as Orlando was literally passing the, the Chilean embassy, just on the edge of Sheridan Circle, Jose Dionisio Suarez activated the two buttons on the remote control detonator that Michael Townley had made. And as the car entered Sheridan Circle, Michael Moffat was very clear. He saw a horribly bright flash of light. And then he said there was a terrible explosion and he went flying out of the back of the car, literally bouncing along the ground. Uh, when he got up, shaking his head, seeing that he wasn't seriously injured, he went to the car because he saw Ronnie staggering out of the car and walking toward the curb, so he assumed she was okay. So he went to the car and he looked in and Letelier's legs had been blown off above the knees and he was just spouting blood and was unconscious. Shortly thereafter, the uniformed Secret Service people who was protect embassies in that area showed up and immediately, of course, vomited at the edge of the car when they saw the scene. Um, Michael began to shout, Pinochet did it, Dina did it, and that's the scene my wife saw when she drove through. They quickly sealed off Sheridan Circle. So that was the day of the bombing. I mean, IPS was a total mess afterwards. Nobody really knew what the hell to do. I mean, we're, everybody was terrified. Who could have done such a horrific act in Washington, D.C.? Well, we knew who did it. Who else could have done it? The right wing immediately started spewing bullshit that this was done by the widow who was jealous uh, of supposed lovers and she was going to collect the insurance. The insurance came to, I think, $20,000, which was ridiculous. Uh, that this was done by the left to create its own martyr. I mean, how do you like that one, right? And I, yeah, I said to the FBI guy, I said, when in criminal history has, this, has the left ever done such a thing? He says, never. I said, so why are you investigating it? He says, we have to clear up these rumors. Anyway, it was stuff like that that was going on that was very uh, discomforting, whereas Everybody obviously knew who had done it. Well, finally, the FBI did strike. They published Michael Townley's, they finally got a hold of his picture from the passports that nobody had responded to the re request, remember, of the ambassador? Well, finally, they, the FBI got a hold of these visa requests with the photos, and they published them in Chile's leading newspaper, El Mercurio. And immediately, Townley was identified, and the Chilean government said, okay, you can have him. And they captured Townley and took him onto the plane. And on the plane, Bob Scherer, who had been the uh, legal attache, the FBI agent at the US Embassy in Buenos Aires, played the father figure with him, and Townley confessed. So they had him. And that's how the case developed, and that's how we followed it. Um, the second trial came a couple of years later. And all of the mistakes that the U.S. attorney, Eugene Proper, had been warned about by Michael Tiger, remember the attorney who took on the civil case, don't try the aiding and abetting along with the conspiracy to assassinate, he said. Separate the cases. Proper refused to do that. He says, don't use jailhouse informants as witnesses. Proper used the jailhouse informant. And of course, the appellate court said, new trial. And so there was a new trial. 
And at the second trial was an all-white, middle-class Washington, D.C. jury. And on the stand, for three solid weeks, Michael Townley had to confess to his sins. He had to admit all of what he did in the assassination. And the question was why he was given a 10-year sentence for plea bargaining, and these people were facing life sentences for conspiracy to assassinate. Anyway, the white jury was sufficiently confused as to vote not guilty. And I remember being totally stunned at how anybody could have been so stupid as to fall for this crap. And I stood in the hallway at the, in, in the Hall of Justice, uh, which is supposedly, according to Lenny Bruce, the only place there's justice at the Hall of Justice is in the hall. <laughs> and there was Guillermo Novo celebrating with his family. And he said uh, quite loudly so I could hear it and looking straight at me, he said, y ahora vamos a acabarnos con lo demás de los hijos de puta comunistas. Now we're going to get the rest of those SOB commies. And uh, I maturely responded like this, <laughs> which was a big mistake on my part because he shrugged his shoulders and started to stride toward me menacingly. And I was frozen in fear. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, uh, Bob Scherer, the FBI agent, was standing next to me and inter interposed his body between us and showed Novo his gun. And they had some words. And uh, Shara turned to me, he says, you are one big asshole, right? <laughs> he said, that man's a stone cold killer. What are you doing? <laughs> and I had to admit he was right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, they walked. I mean, Guillermo was convicted of perjury, lying about his knowledge of the assassination. But the judge ruled he'd already served his two plus years and they were free to go. Townley went into witness protection. Townley moved into witness protection. He served five of a 10-year sentence, five years of a 10-year sentence. Um, well, that's the story of the assassination. IPS remained in a state of tense <coughs> semi-terror. I mean, they did it once, they could do it again. You know, who, who knew? Um, Guillermo had publicly blamed me for the, for the arrests. He said, the FBI couldn't have done this without them, which was probably not true. But uh, anyway, there I was accused by a killer. And uh, so we had to stay on guard. I, I mean, I remember always sitting with my back to the wall, facing the door when I would go out to eat in a restaurant and stuff like that. I was nervous. Um, I mean, not like the day after Letelier was killed when I tried to put the key into my car lock and my hand was trembling because we didn't know what had set off the bomb at that time. Anyway, that's the story of the, the basic case and how it ended. Later on, Contreras and uh, Espinosa Bravo, the one and two people in the Dina, were convicted in Chile of crimes related to the Letelier case and are still in prison today because they also did lots of other crimes. Townley lives in Kansas. He's no longer in witness protection. Guillermo Novo still struts in the streets of Miami. He was indicted in Panama in 1999 for conspiracy to assassinate Fidel Castro. Police said, the evidence we have against you is that there's uh, tons of, there's just uh, oodles of explosives in your rent-a-car with your fingerprints on them. And, Novo's response was, you call that evidence? I want to jump ahead a little bit to the Juan Garcés story and how IPS first got to know him and what he went on to do. I don't want to yes. spoil the story. Juan Garcés was a young Spanish lawyer who had done his doctorate in political science in France. And he came to Chile and became a very close advisor to President Allende. <clears throat> on the day of the coup, as the shooting started and everybody was holed up in the Moneda Palace in Santiago, Allende said to Garces, you don't need to be here. Go out and make sure the world knows the story. And Garces started out to take refuge in the Spanish embassy since he was a Spanish citizen. Allende said, come back. 
And he said, let me see your briefcase. And Garces opened his briefcase, and Allende took his pistol out. And he said, now you can go. Garces went out, showed his Spanish citizenship, and got to the Spanish embassy and got asylum. In the late 1980s, he came to IPS and did a two-year fellowship here uh, to do research on a book he was preparing. And we got to be close friends. <clears throat> and he said, and he had written already a little history of the Chile under the coup in Allende, but never published in English. And at that time, he raised the issue of, let's get all of the US documents, the stuff that has not been released, and see what the US government was up to at this point. And so we sat together with Mike Tiger and Sam Buffone, the lawyers on the civil case, and with the former US attorney, Larry Barcella, who was quite cooperative at, also at this point, and we petitioned for a release of documents, which later, by the way, we got. Anyway, Garces went back to Spain and wrote a brief for a Spanish judge named Garzón, who filed through Interpol um, a writ to arrest General Pinochet, who had just gone to London for back surgery. Juan Garces wrote the brief, uh, using his knowledge of the case and of the law. And as Pinochet came out of his anesthetic after back surgery, he did not recognize two people who were standing above his bed. One was a cop and the other was a translator. And you know, basically they said, you are under arrest, you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to a lawyer, all the stuff. The British have the same stuff. And Pinochet was placed under arrest, and he stayed under arrest in England for over a year, thanks to the work of Juan Garces and the judge Garzón, who had courage enough to file this writ. Then, in an act of total cowardice, the British government uh, capitulated and let Pinochet go on the grounds that he was too demented to face trial and too physically sick. Pinochet was flown back to Chile, and as he arrived, he practically danced the jig as he got off the plane and remembered the names of all his fellow officers who had come out to greet him. Anyway, Garces played and continued to stick with the case and still with it. Can I just fill in a little bit of that story? Because I was lucky enough to go with Saul and Juan Garces and some of the other uh, gang, Larry Barcella, the former prosecutor, um, to various meetings in the Clinton administration when Garces was seeking uh, U.S. cooperation with this case. And I, I sat there while he explained to them, yeah, I'm, I'm preparing this case. We want to bring uh, Pinochet, this Chile former Chilean dictator, to trial in Spain. And, and, all, and, and I saw these you know, U.S. government people kind of rolling their eyes and thinking this was quite laughable that this Spanish lawyer would ever pull something like this off. And so then when Pinochet was indeed arrested, it, it, and, and he made uh, legal history. I mean, he went from being kind of a, a laughing stock to a, making uh, legal history. And, and, and uh, for years then afterwards, um, other former dictators were afraid to travel. Uh, we uh, called that, you know, the threat of being Pinochet because they were afraid if they got medical, you know, um, treatment somewhere else, they might wind up the same way. And so, just seeing how, you know, somebody toiling away was really deeply, you know, affected by his experience in the coup, and how he turned that into this just lifelong struggle that that really uh, set incredible legal precedents and and shook up a lot of dictators around the world. That was really something to watch. And led people to do other investigation. For example, Riggs Bank on DuPont Circle was the place where Pinochet had stashed several million dollars. He wasn't the only dictator who was using Riggs Bank. Yeah, and, and that, I think, led to the fact that Pinochet never did, in the end, have to face trial, but he really did die in disgrace. Not only was he proved to be you know, a murderer, but also a thief. He was stealing from his own people, and that really changed the public uh, view of him in, inside Chile.